Thanks for attending this virtual tutorial on the basics of fractional frequency synthesis. My name is Sudhakar Pamarthi. I'm a professor of ECE at the University of California, Los Angeles. Now, frequency synthesis is a central function in all kinds of applications. In communications and radar applications, it is used to generate local oscillator signals and sometimes perform phase or frequency modulation. In data conversion and high-speed I.O. applications, it is used to generate low jitter sampling clocks. In digital systems, it is used to provide a synchronizing clocks. The applications are far too many and quite well known. Let me spell out what this tutorial assumes you know. It assumes a basic knowledge of the concepts of sampling, digital and analog filtering, Laplace and Z-transforms, autocorrelation, and power spectral density of random sequences. It also assumes a working knowledge of an integer and phase lock loop, specifically how it works, what the basic circuit components are, and especially the trade-offs between loop bandwidth and circuit noise. There have been many tutorials on fractional and phase lock loops and other frequency synthesizers. Most of them focus on the circuit aspects of these blocks. In this tutorial, I will take a slightly different approach. I will assume that you know how the basic circuits work for the most part. And instead, focus on the system level aspects of fractional frequency synthesis. This will allow us to identify common unifying themes in different kinds of frequency synthesizers and compare and contrast them. Accordingly, I will focus on fractional frequency division and digital delta sigma modulation as key building blocks. I will describe these operations and model them in detail. Armed with this basic knowledge, then I will describe frequency synthesis approaches by grouping them roughly into closed loop and open loop approaches. Let us start with the simplest frequency synthesis technique. It employs an integer and phase lock loop. The loop sets the frequency of a high frequency voltage controlled oscillator using negative feedback. The negative feedback works by comparing the phases of a reference oscillator and the divide by n blocks output. Accordingly, it speeds up or slows down the VCO. The negative feedback forces the reference oscillator and the divider output to be in phase step in steady state. Accordingly, in steady state, the VCO locks to a frequency that is exactly n times the reference frequency. Frequency synthesis is achieved simply by setting the integer n as desired. The frequency resolution is FREF. For example, a 48 megahertz reference results in a 48 megahertz resolution. Unfortunately, this is too coarse for most applications. Now, final resolution can be achieved by including frequency dividers K and M before or after the PLL. For example, FRF is equal to 48 megahertz, K is equal to 48, and M is equal to 1 gives us 1 megahertz resolution. This implies that the PLL now runs on a 1 megahertz reference. Unfortunately, type 2 PLL bandwidths are limited to a tenth of the reference frequency for stability considerations. So our PLL bandwidth would be at most 100 kilohertz. Since VCO noise is suppressed only within the PLL bandwidth, this greatly increases VCO noise contribution. This is very undesirable. Using a large output division ratio M can also improve resolution. However, the output frequency range is greatly reduced. So bottom line, this approach of using dividers before or after the PLL um, allows us finer resolution, but only at the expense of frequency range, higher noise, and so on. Trade-offs that are not particularly desirable to us.
Now, several approaches have been reported to resolve this frequency resolution bottleneck. I like to group them into open loop and closed loop approaches. Let's look at the open loop approach first. Let us start with a high frequency oscillator, example from an integer and PLL. Suppose we follow it up with a frequency divider whose division ratio is dynamically changed as an integer n plus a sequence of small integers y of n. On average, the output frequency is simply FPLL divided by n plus alpha, where alpha is the average value of the sequence y of n. Note that alpha can be an arbitrary fraction, so very fine resolution is possible. Even frequency range is not sacrificed if n were set to a small number such as 1 or 2. We will discuss the advantages and disadvantages of this approach and its variants in great detail later on. For now, we call this an open loop approach as it does not disturb the original uh, oscillator, but only operates or processes its output. Now, closed loop approaches are an alternative. In these approaches, we adjust the main oscillator in the phase lock loop itself to achieve frequency synthesis. There are many variants of this. Let me show you one. This is called an offset phase lock loop. And here is another. This is called the fractional end phase lock loop. The fractional end phase lock loop is the most popular version. To tune the PLL to n plus alpha times the difference frequency FREF, the feedback division ratio is changed dynamically according to n plus y of n. Again, y of n is a sequence of small integers that average to a fraction alpha. We will discuss the fractional and phase lock loop in great detail later on as well. Now let us compare the approaches at a high level. When generating a single output frequency, the closed loop approach is a clear winner. Researchers have demonstrated excellent phase noise, jitter, and spur performance. However, in applications that need the generation of multiple output frequencies, the closed loop approach is not preferred. Let me explain. In the closed loop approach, to generate each frequency, you need its own PLL. And each PLL has its own oscillator, which consumes a lot of power and area. The area is primarily because of the use of an inductor to keep the phase noise low. In contrast, the open loop approach uses a single integer and PLL. And the frequency dividers are very small and do not contribute much noise. In fine technology nodes, they do not even consume much power. So accordingly, the closed loop approach has large area and high power, whereas the open loop approach has are fairly compact and low power. However, in the absence of feedback control, the open loop approaches suffer from strong spurious tones and high jitter. Let us examine these aspects in more detail. Now, you would have noticed that three building blocks are common and central to both these approaches. Oscillators, frequency dividers, and digital delta sigma modulators that choose the Y of N. Oscillators are a very well-studied subject, so I'm not going to discuss uh, them here. So we will focus on frequency dividers and the digital delta sigma modulators that help us choose the Y of N. In each case, what we will do is we will talk about basic operation and obtain a simple signal processing model and then discuss some finer aspects. Let us start with the frequency divider. The simplest frequency divider is basically a digital counter working on clock edges of the input. 
But let us examine what happens when we dynamically change the dividend ratio. Here is an example where n is equal to 4 and y of n is a repeating sequence of a 0 followed by three ones, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and so on. The sequence clearly has an average of 0.75. So the divider output has an average frequency of FPLL divided by 4.75. Note that the divider never exactly divides by 4.75, but either divides by 4 when y of n is 0 or by 5 when y of n is equal to 1. So the divider's output edges can exhibit large jitter compared to the ideal. So let's illustrate. So here, VPLL is a square wave representing the input. FPLL over N plus alpha, this bottom waveform, that is an ideal waveform that is 4.75 times lower frequency than FPLL. Now, if you were always dividing by 4.75, that is what you would get. Now, when, you, when y of n is 0, we divide by 4, so the divider output is occurs earlier than the ideal edge. When the divider, when y of n is 1, we divide by 5, so you get a different jitter. So if tau of n, if we define tau of n as a jitter, the time difference between where the actual divider output is and where it should be, you can see that there is substantial jitter. In this case, it can be as large as 3 quarters of the PLL period. So bottom line, with this approach, the divider's output edge, uh, edges can exhibit uh, significant jitter. We can model this thing mathematically fairly easily. Let's compare the rising edges of the actual divider output and the ideal divider output. So this desired V div of t is the ideal divider output and V div of t is the actual divider output. So let's just compare these two edges and these two edges. Now, in the nth period, the divider divides by n plus y of n. So that means that from the rising edge of the actual V div to the next rising edge of the actual V div, we have n plus y of n times uh, n plus y of n t PLL. It's that many cycles of the PLL. If tau of n and tau of n minus 1 are the jitters, Basically, we can show that tau of n is tau of n minus 1 plus y of n minus alpha times TPLL. Basically, what's happening is that y of n minus alpha is the fraction of one PLL period, and that's the amount of error, uh, time error we are incurring in each uh, division cycle. So let's see what this means. So I can take this difference equation, tau of n is equal to tau of n minus 1 plus y of n minus alpha times TPLL. I do some mathematical manipulation, and we can easily show that the jitter on the nth edge, nth cycle, is actually proportional to the running sum of the errors I'm making in each of the previous cycles. So basically, it's like I take y of n, subtract alpha, that's my instantaneous error, and I integrate that, accumulate that, and that tells me how many of these PLL cycles jitter I have. Accordingly, this timing jitter causes phase noise. We can get that thing simply by scaling this tau of n with t dev and multiplying by 2 pi. With a little bit of manipulation, we get this nice expression. Now, this is a sequence of phase errors. If you are interested in the continuous time phase noise as a result, we can model that thing pictorially fairly simply. So basically, y of n minus alpha, this represents the instantaneous frequency errors normalized to the divider output frequency. This digital, uh, this discrete accumulator block uh, basically corresponds to conversion from frequency errors to phase errors. So this output is basically the phase errors in PL cycles. Now when I scale it down to the divider output, then this signal out here is the error in radiance with respect to the divider phase. Now that's a sequence of phase errors, phi of 0, phi of 1, phi of 2, and so on. To get to the continuous time equivalent phase, we 
treat it as as if there is a zeroth order hold and the width of zeroth order hold is basically the nominal frequency uh, width of the divider output t div and you basically have a zeroth order held version of the phase it turns out as we just described the jitter is too high it's comparable to the input pll period which is very large accordingly the phase noise is also very high furthermore the integration means that there are very large close in phase noise cuts okay now we have a model of the dynamic frequency division and the resulting phase noise but we have not really talked about how to choose y of n all we said is that y of n has the desired average value alpha so let's focus on how to choose y of n let's look at what our options are what we can do and so on so how should we choose y of n now if we look at our model for the phase noise resulting from this resulting from changing the division ratio all the time uh, three things are apparent number 1 y of n should have an average value of alpha right otherwise your frequency will be wrong it won't be what you want it to be number 2 y of n minus alpha should not be periodic if it is periodic what happens is that then the resulting phase sequence and the phase noise would also be periodic that means that the divider output will have very strong spurious tones in its post spectral density and finally y of n minus alpha should have very little low frequency content why is that let's take a look if you have substantial low frequency content the integration the digital accumulation here which basically is a low pass filter will preserve that low frequency content which means it will show up as low frequency content in the phase noise which means that you basically have a lot of close in phase noise now most applications do not like close in phase noise so because of these reasons we want y of n uh, should to average to alpha we want y of n minus alpha to be not periodic and we want y of n minus alpha to have very little low frequency content let us look at a, a popular choice of generating y of n it's called a flying adder basically the flying adder uses a digital accumulator clocked by the divider output the input is a binary representation of the desired fraction alpha the carry out signal of this adder generates y of n so because it's a carry out signal y of n can be either 0 or 1 now here are two examples let's look at the case when alpha is equal to 0.2 the accumulator starts with 0 and with each cycle of the divider output it goes to 0.2 then 0.4 then 0.6 0.8 and so on once it gets to 1.00 the carry out is set to 1 and the sum goes back to 0 and then we are back to a sum of 0.00 so the cycle repeats basically what happens is y of n is a periodic sequence of four zeros followed by a 1 now if y of n is if alpha is equal to 0.75 you can similarly calculate and conclude that the y of n would be a 0 1 1 1 0 1 1 1 and so on so let's see how well the flying adder does in terms of what we want from y of n as we just saw it is clearly not periodic furthermore for small values of alpha the period is very long meaning that there is substantial low frequency content so this is a bad choice but surprisingly it's a common one now let's look at what i call a coin toss quantizer on every edge of the divider output a hypothetical coin is tossed and y of n is set to 1 on heads and 0 on tails the key is that this hypothetical coin is a biased one the probability of getting heads is exactly equals to alpha 
Now clearly, YFN will have the right average. It is also random, so Y of n is not going to have any periodicity. However, Y of n minus alpha is basically a white noise sequence. So this is like FM noise, white FM noise, and results in large 1 over F square phase noise skirts. So this is also not particularly uh, useful. Our third choice is called a Digital Delta Sigma Modulator, or DDSM for short. It basically quantizes a fractional value alpha coarsely to small integers. So in this case, the fractional value alpha is represented um, as a case bit, k bit 2's complement number. It goes through a bunch of digital filters and whatnot, and then the output gets quantized and some quantizer output is fed back to the digital filters. Essentially, the quantizer is enclosed within negative feedback. The output is usually um, maybe, let's say, a few small integers. So alpha represents fractions, so the internal signals, for example, the input of this quantizer represents fractions, very fine fractions with a large number bit width, but the output y of n represents a very coarse quantization of, let's say, integers, 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on. As I'll show shortly, the resultant y of n satisfies all three of the desired properties. That means it has the right average, it will have a high-pass power speckle density, and it will have no periodicity. So here is an example digital delta sigma modulator. The quantizer is preceded by two integrators in a negative feedback loop. The loop makes y of n minus alpha have a high-pass shaped power spectral density. A one-bit random sequence, g of n, is added to the LSB, the least significant bit of the input. This one-bit random sequence is called LSB dither. It breaks up any periodicities in the sequence y of n minus alpha. As the power spectral density of y of n shows, the quantization noise is high pass shaped. The small flat portion here is basically the dither contribution. So clearly, it has the right average, it has very little low frequency content, and it has no spurs, meeting all our uh, proper, all our requirements from y of n. Now let's take a look at what happens inside a digital delta sigma modulator. To keep things general, let us assume that the DDSM input is a sequence x of n. In our specific case, x of n is a constant alpha. Note that the digital delta sigma modulator is fundamentally a nonlinear feedback system because there's feedback and there's a nonlinear block which we are calling the quantizer. So as you know, um, Analyzing nonlinear feedback systems is very, very difficult to do. However, it can be analyzed by modeling this quantizer, the only nonlinear block in the system. It can be analyzed by modeling this block as an additive error source Q of n. And we call this Q of n a quantizer error. Once you do that, that means once you replace this quantizer with an equivalent additive error source Q of n, then what we have is we have a linear system with two inputs. One is the actual input x, and the other one is this quantizer error q. So accordingly, now the output can be expressed as a two input, one output linear system. And it is described by two transfer functions called the signal transfer function or STF and the noise transfer function or NTF. In other words, it is as if the digital delta sigma monitor output is made of two terms, a filtered input, that's this path here, and a filtered quantizer error, that is this path here. Now, typically, the signal transfer function is just a few sample delays. On the other hand, the noise transfer function is usually chosen to have a high pass shape. Other shapes are also possible, but I will not have time to discuss them here. Now, when talking about a digital delta sigma modulator, 
it is useful to make a distinction between the quantizer error q of n and its filtered version. This filtered version, that is the output of this noise transfer function, usually referred to as quantization noise or more descriptively, shaped quantization noise. Okay, now before we proceed any further, we need to really understand the nature of the quantization error q of n. So here I'm showing you an example, uh, input r of n and output y of n of the quantizer and the green curve is basically the effective error q of n. Right? It's a simple uh, quantizer called a metroid quantizer and I'm arbitrarily assuming that uh, the output has only five levels, minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. So over this range from minus, uh, one, uh, minus two to plus two, the quantization error is within minus half and plus half. Beyond that thing, it is bigger. Now, traditionally, the samples of this Q of N are modeled as independent of the quantizer input R of N and other samples of Q of N. That means Q of N is independent of R of N and Q of N is independent of, let us say, Q of M, where M and N are different uh, samples. The samples of Q of N are also assumed to be identically distributed. That means every sample of Q of N is assumed to be statistically similar. Right? Specifically, they're assumed to be zero mean and bounded between minus half and plus half. This is, of course, not true in general. Like I just explained with this figure, if, the, if we limit the quantizer to have only five output levels, then clearly uh, Q of N is not bounded to minus half and plus half. So this is called overloading. So when the Q of N is not bounded by minus half and plus half, we say that the quantizer is overloading. Now here is another example of where this traditional model is not true. Suppose the quantizer input R of N is a constant. In this case, y of n will be a constant and q of n will also be a constant. Clearly, that means that, the, and not only that, the q of n depends on the r of n in this case. So clearly, this violates the independence assumptions. So overall, it is very important to know that the quantization noise, quantization error does not satisfy the traditional model. So if it is not true, then why do we use the traditional model? For one thing, it makes the math significantly easier. As I'll show you next, we can make predictions about the post-structural density of the Q of N and its variance. In turn, that will allow us to get a useful model for the digital delta sigma model. So that's the primary reason why we use a traditional model. More importantly, we can actually make the traditional model be true by using one bit LSB dither. In the example I showed you one bit LSB dither, it turns out in many cases, the one bit LSB dither actually makes sure that the traditional model of the quantizer error is valid. We'll discuss this thing a little while later. So assuming that the traditional model is correct, it follows that Q of N is simply a white noise sequence. If the DDSN has a wide data path, that means if R of N is represented by a large number of bits, then you can show that Q of N approximately has zero mean and a variance of one over 12. Now, typically in most delta sigma modulators used in fractional synthesis, the bit widths in the delta sigma modulator are very wide. It is not surprising to see numbers like 30 bits, 40 bits and so on. So accordingly, in the traditional model, Q of N is a white noise sequence with a variance of 1 over 12. So if you look at the post spectral density of Q of N, it's basically going to be flat. It's a white noise sequence. So now finally, we have a model for the digital delta sigma modulator. The output Y of N contains the input and the quantization noise. The quantization noise is the white Q of N of variance 1 over 12, shaped by the noise transfer function NTF. If the delta sigma modulator input 
x of n were a constant alpha, which is our case, then the PSG of y of n minus alpha is simply the shaped quantization noise, which is basically 1 over 12, the variance of q of n, multiplied by the magnitude square of the noise transfer function. So that is the quantization noise or the shaped quantization noise. Let us look at a popular delta sigma modulator called the lth order delta sigma modulator. This is a modulator whose noise transform function is an lth order digital differentiator. That is one minus zero to the minus one raised to the lth power, where l is an integer. Okay. The signal transfer function is usually just simply a number of integer delays. I'm showing you zero to the minus l here, that's l sample delays, but it could be any other number of delays. Here is an example implementation of an lth order digital delta signal modulator. Um, you can do the math by modeling this quantizer as an additive error source, and you can show that the signal transfer function is uh, num some number of delays, and the noise transfer function is exactly lth digital differentiator. Right? Note that this particular implementation is not unique. There are many other ways in which the same lth order noise transfer function and signal transfer function can be realized. And I'll talk about a thing briefly later. But first, let us take a closer look at the shape of the quantization noise in the lth order delta sigma modulator. It's high pass shaped, like I'm showing you in this figure. And it rises at 20 times L dB per decade. Right? So here I'm showing you sketches of three different cases, power spectral density of the quantization noise, shaped quantization noise for three different cases. The gray one is a first order, the red is the second order, and the green is the third order delta sigma modulator. So accordingly, the noise is high pass in each case and rises at 20 dB per decade, 30, 40 dB per decade, and 60 dB per decade. As you can see, higher order modulators push the quantization noise aggressively into higher frequencies. Now let's go back to the example delta sigma modulator I showed you earlier. It turns out this is a second order digital delta sigma modulator. The noise transfer function is one minus z inverse square. So accordingly, y of n minus alpha equals a delayed version of the dither and the second order difference of the quantizer error, right? Because the noise transfer function is one minus z inverse square. So in sample domain, it basically means q of n minus two times q of n minus one plus q of n minus two, right? And the quantization noise, shaped quantization noise rises at 40 dB per decade. Note that the input of the digital delta sigma modulator doesn't have to be a constant fraction value alpha. We can add a slowly varying signal m of n to it. Now the output y of n, which is still a sequence of small integers, now what happens is it is equal to the input m of n plus alpha and the high pass shaped quantization noise. So in this case, it is a second order delta sigma modulator. So what we have is the output is equal to alpha plus the input, modulation input delayed by two samples plus the dither, LSB dither delayed by two samples. And again, second order difference, differentiated, differentiated quantization error. Okay. As we'll show later, this can be used to impart frequency or phase modulation to both open loop and closed loop systems. Now, before we conclude our discussion on digital delta sigma modulators, two things are important to note. First, about the role of LSB dither. Even a one bit random sequence added to just the LSB of the delta sigma modulator can make the quantization error white. Basically what happens is that this tiny bit of randomness, random dither, 
goes through the delta sigma modulator and it gets accumulated in these integrators. And then over time, it builds up to a large random input to the uh, quantizer. And as it builds up, it breaks up any limit cycle, periodic cycles and so on. Okay. Of course, this won't work in all cases. If three conditions are satisfied, we can guarantee that Q of N becomes white. We can theoretically guarantee this. Condition A, the quantizer does not overload. That means the output has enough number of levels such that Q of N is bounded between minus half and plus half. Number two, the modulator has a second order or higher order. So it does not work in first order delta sigma modulators. Number three, there is no saturation or truncation or rounding anywhere in the delta sigma other than in the main quantizer, right? So basically all other paths have integer valued impulse responses. So theoretically we have proven that if these conditions are satisfied, then this one bit LS bit dither uh, will make sure that the quantization error is white. So these two power spectral densities I'm showing you here kind of show that thing. So the figure on the left is the power spectral density of the quantization noise without using this dither. And figure on the right is the same system, same input, constant input X of N, but now the one bit dither is applied. Clearly with the dither, LSB dither, the strong spurs are all gone. And basically what you have is you have a very smooth shaped quantization noise. Fortunately, most useful delta sigma modulators fall under the category specified by these three conditions. We do not have time to delve deeper into this subject, which is a favorite of mine. So what I've done is I've provided references for those of you who are interested at the end of this tutorial. The second aspect we should note is the choice of DDSM architecture. That is how the delta sigma modulator is implemented. Now a given delta sigma modulator can be realized in multiple ways. These are called architectures. Consider the second order delta sigma modulator. This structure, which we have been talking about so far as examples, is what is called a multiple loop architecture. Because you can see there are more than one loops here, one and two. Here is another architecture which is called uh, an error feedback architecture or an error feedback structure. Here, the quantizer error is computed and it is fed back. So it's called an error feedback structure. Here is yet another structure. This is called multi-quantizer or multi-stage or MASH architecture. So here, the second order delta sigma modulator is broken up into two parts, two first order delta sigma modulator parts, and then they are combined together. And here is the main idea. As long as the noise transfer function is the same, as long as the noise transfer function is the same and the number of output levels are the same, all of these architectures are equivalent. Now, this may come as a surprise to those of you who are familiar with analog delta sigma modulators. The reason is that in analog delta sigma modulators, they are sensitive to mismatches, etc. Whereas in digital delta sigma monitor, there is no such mismatch sensitivity. So accordingly, as long as the noise transfer function is the same and the number of levels in the output is the same, from a signal processing point of view, each of these structures is equivalent, which means when you're implementing it, you can pick one of them or the other purely based on hardware, power, latency considerations with no impact on the overall noise performance or linearity performance of the um, fractional synthesizer system. So to recap, I introduced frequency synthesis at a very high level. I identified two key building blocks, frequency dividers with changing division ratios and digital delta sigma modulators. And now, we are ready to get into the details of closed loop and open loop frequency synthesizers. Let us start with the popular closed loop approach 
called the delta sigma fractional n phase lock loop. So here is a block diagram of the delta sigma fraction and phase lock loop. The idea is simply to change the feedback division ratio of an integer and PLL according to a sequence of integers y of n generated by a digital delta sigma modulator. Suppose the digital delta sigma modulator has input is a sum of a fraction alpha and a sequence of small fractional values m of n. The fractional phase lock loop will tune to n plus alpha times the reference frequency. Furthermore, its instantaneous frequency will track m of n times FRF. Choosing alpha allows us to basically get arbitrary frequency synthesis with arbitrarily fine granularity. The resolution is not limited by FRF anymore we would have broken the uh, frequency resolution uh, bottleneck that we discussed earlier. Furthermore, by using M of N, we can directly generate a frequency modulated or even a phase modulated uh, signal that is useful in many, many uh, transmitter applications and um, other applications such as generating spread spectrum clocks and so on and so forth. So let us construct a, an accurate model for the delta sigma fractional and phase lock loop. Recall the model of the frequency division with a changing division ratio. Y of n minus alpha represents the normalized instantaneous frequency errors that get integrated to phase errors. Also, recall the model of the digital delta sigma modulator. Right? The input was a constant alpha plus some modulation and the output y of n minus alpha is now modulation filtered by a signal transfer function plus the quantization noise, shaped quantization noise. Consider a simple continuous time model of the underlying integer and phase lock loop. You can recognize the models of the phase frequency detector and the charge pump, the loop filter, the VCO, and the divider. Note that the model uses the division ratio of n plus alpha rather than n because in steady state, the fractional phase lock loop will lock to n plus alpha times FRF. As we discussed earlier, the fractional operation that is changing the division ratios induces phase errors between the divider output and its reference and the reference. The blocks in red model this effect. Again, y of n minus alpha represents the normalized instantaneous frequency errors, and they get accumulated into phase errors. These phase errors are detected by the PLL's phase detector. And the PLL will effectively low pass filter these phase errors according to the PLL's transfer function. The instantaneous frequency errors themselves are comprised of the desired frequency modulation term m of n filtered by the signal transfer function and the white quantizer error filtered by the noise transfer function. So this is the model of the delta sigma fraction and phase lock. Putting all these terms together, we have a fairly simple model for the delta sigma fraction and phase lock. The instantaneous frequency deviations caused by the modulation and the quantization error are accumulated to phase, uh, and that sequence is zeroth order held to base zeroth order held to give you a, an equivalent continuous time phase error waveform, and that phase error waveform is filtered by the normalized PLL's transfer function. Here is an example normalized PLL's uh, transfer function. I have given the expression here as well for those of you who are interested. Bottom line, it is a low pass filter. K is the bandwidth of the PLL in radians per second. Sometimes it may have peaking, sometimes it may not have peaking depending on what kind of a PLL that you design, what kind of phase margin you have and so on. Now, since we know that 
Q of n is white and has a variance of 1 over 12. And so if we have an lth order digital delta sigma modulator in the fraction PLL, that means the noise transfer function is 1 minus z inverse raised to the power of L, then we can actually calculate the contribution to the phase noise in the PLL. And we can show that the post-fractal density is this expression here. Without going too much into the detail of this expression, note that the phase noise is filtered by the PLL's transfer function. That means it's low-pass filtered according to this transfer function. And note also, also that the phase noise is inversely proportional to the uh, uh, reference frequency. So if you have a higher reference frequency, it is as if you have... Um, an ability to change the division ratio more often, so you're able to approximate the desired alpha better. So hence, you have a lower phase noise. Also note that the phase noise rises as 20 times L minus 1 dB per decade for low frequency offsets. The delta sigma modulator itself, the noise transfer function, the phase noise rises as 20 L times dB per decade. But because we have a frequency to phase conversion, you lose one order of shape. So net result, we have the phase noise rising at 20 times L minus 1 dB per decade. So consider the second order digital delta sigma fractional phase lock loop. The quantization noise accordingly will rise at 40 dB per decade. And once it shows up as phase noise, it rises as 20 dB per decade, one order less. And once it hits the bandwidth of the PLL, it starts getting attenuated by the PLL's uh, transfer function. This is the post density of the PLL output itself. Here is a measured spectrum of the same second order delta sigma fractional and PLL's output. Uh, the reference frequency is 48 megahertz, N is 51, and alpha is 0 0.081875, and you see this tall spike here, that is the main carrier. The smaller spikes on the side, they are undesirable spurious tones called fractional spurs. Usually they show up at alpha times the reference frequency FRF and at harmonics of them. So we'll talk about them a little while later. As you can see, there is very little closing phase noise. Most of it is suppressed by the a PLL, I think we may have used a 50 or 100 kilohertz bandwidth in this thing. So you have a very, very clean um, uh, clock at a desired fractional frequency generated. Now, this is a fairly old system from my PhD days. Uh, you can be rest assured, but that uh, researchers have done exceedingly well since then. And modern delta sigma fractional phase lock loops have outstanding performance, both in terms of noise and uh, spurious tones. Let's take a closer look at the design trade-offs and what not involved in this. Thing, okay? Consider the phase noise uh, caused by fractional operation at a 3 megahertz offset for this example PLL. And let's assume that the PLL has a bandwidth of about 500 kilohertz and um, and let us say it provides about 19 dB attenuation at the 3 megahertz offset, okay? So with a reference frequency of 48 megahertz and a second order delta sigma, that is L is equal to two, if you plug in the values, you can calculate it that the phase noise due to fractional operation alone at a 3 megahertz offset is about minus 104 dBc per hertz, okay? And that's kind of verified by this uh, PSD simulation, similar PSD. Now, again, note that within the PLL's bandwidth, the phase noise rises as 20 dB per decade. And once it hits the bandwidth, it kind of stops growing and then starts getting attenuated. Now, let us look at a few design examples to explore how this phase noise can be reduced further. Basically, we look at what options we have to reduce this thing. One choice is to increase the reference frequency. So that is our choice number two. Let us say we just increase our reference frequency from 48 megahertz to 192 megahertz. That means we quadrupled it. Okay. So notice that for a second order delta sigma, that is L is equal to two, the phase noise is inversely proportional to 
uh, FRF Q, right? That means that uh, you're going to have a significant improvement in the phase noise, reduction in the phase noise if you increase the uh, reference frequency. It turns out by quadrupling the reference frequency, we can get about 18 dB uh, reduction. Now, however, uh, higher order crystals that can generate this 192 megahertz reference tend to be more expensive. Uh, this, so this may not be a preferred option in many cases. Sometimes standards and um, may restrict what kind of reference frequencies you can use and so on. Besides, both the phase frequency detector, the charge pump, and the delta sigma modulator, they all have to run at a higher speed at 192 megahertz. That means they result in a much higher power consumption. In very finely scaled technologies, that may not be an issue, but if you are operating in a slightly older technology, no, that could be a problem. Another choice is to use a higher order digital delta sigma modulator. Going to a third order delta sigma modulator, that's our choice number three, reduces the noise by about 15 dB in this case, compared to the second order 48 megahertz case. However, if you have a third order delta sigma modulator, then the quantization noise rises at 60 dB per decade. And after conversion to phase, the phase rises at 40 dB per decade. So type two PLLs may have difficulty suppressing such fast rising phase noise, particularly close to the bandwidth of the PLL. Yet another choice, and actually a popular choice when generating local oscillators and other such, other, uh, such single, frequency, single tone frequencies is to use a low bandwidth. As shown in this figure here, if you use a lower bandwidth, the phase lock loop starts attenuating the quantization noise much earlier. So for example, this red is with a PLL of bandwidth 500 kilohertz and the green is for a PLL of bandwidth 50 kilohertz. So the quantization noise the phase noise resulting from the quantization noise would have been rising like so, but then once it hits 50 kilohertz, it starts getting attenuated. So overall phase noise because of the delta sigma is significantly lower. Basically, as shown, lower PLL bandwidths greatly suppress the phase noise caused by fractional operation. Note that phase cancellation or phase noise cancellation techniques have also been reported. And there is quite a bit of uh, state of the art built on those lines. However, I'm just not going to discuss them in this particular tutorial. So far, we have looked solely at the additional phase noise contributed by the fractional operation. That is the direct cost of doing fractional frequency synthesis. However, fractional operation affects other aspects of the basic PLL itself. The circuit noise sources in the fractional phase lock loop are all the same as an integer and PLL. You have charge pump noise, reference noise, filter noise, VCO noise, buffer noise, and so on and so forth. However, two things are important. First, the charge pump in a fractional phase lock loop contributes considerably higher noise than an integer and PLL. The second thing is, there is an inherent trade-off between the phase noise contributions of the delta sigma modulator and the oscillator in the PLL. Let's take a closer look at these two. Uh, let's first look at the oscillator noise versus fractional noise trade-off. So here, I'm showing you the noise transfer function seen by the uh, phase noise, seen by the delta sigma noise, and seen by the VCO noise. So basically the VCO noise is high pass filtered. That means it is suppressed within the bandwidth of the PLL. Whereas the noise from the Delta Sigma is low pass filtered. That means suppressed within the, uh, beyond the bandwidth of the PLL. Okay. So consider a case when you have a high bandwidth. So the blue is the net contribution of the VCO noise. You have a high bandwidth. So a lot of the VCO noise is suppressed. So it remains fairly low. But because you have a high PLL bandwidth, most of the fractional end noise is not suppressed. So overall noise can be dominated by the, or limited by the delta sigma noise. 
In contrast, if the PLL bandwidth is low, then what happens is that the VCO noise is not suppressed much. So you have a lot of VCO noise. And then the fractional noise is suppressed quite a bit, like this dashed red line. But now the overall noise can be limited by the VCO noise. So overall, we have a trade-off between the contribution of the delta sigma and fractional noise and the oscillator noise. Uh, oscillator noise. So typically designers try to optimize by choosing the right bandwidth such that you uh, minimize the overall contribution. But the trade-off remains a fundamental issue. The second problem is that unlike in integer and phase lock loops, the fractional and phase lock loop sees large phase errors even in steady state. Since the charge pump dumps noise charge during the time it is on, so for example, the typical operation of a charge pump, reference waveform, divider waveform, the up and down pumps usually in an integer and PLL, they only stay on for a common duration called the dead zone duration of duration T subscript D, right? And that dominates over this tau when only one of the things is on. So most of the noise is contributed by the charge pump during this time. In a fractional and phase lock loop, because even in steady state, the reference and divider don't line up, because after all, the divider is not dividing by n plus alpha, but n plus y of n. So what happens is that the charge pump remains on for a longer time. So this tau, where only one of the pumps is on, is usually much larger. So two problems arise. Number one, like I said, the charge pump noise is higher. Number two, predicting the charge pump noise is significantly complicated. Why? Because the duration of this pulse, when the charge pump noise is contributing, changes with the division ratio and so on. So how can we quantify it simply? Suppose that in an integer and PLL, the charge pump stays on for T subscript D. Uh, duration during each reference period. Now the fractional operation, the delta sigma, will prolong this thing. On average, let us say it gets extended to T subscript D effective. And uh, the extension, the extra time, is basically the average of the magnitude of tau of n. Remember, tau of n is the timing error between the reference and the divider output because of delta sigma fractional operation. We showed earlier that it is basically proportional to the running sum of the quantization. Okay, So if it is positive, it means positive or negative means that the difference or divider is ahead of, divider is ahead of the reference or behind the reference. So we can approximate this thing by taking the average of the magnitude of this thing. Now, usually that is difficult to estimate. However, if you given the delta sigma modulator's order, and we can calculate this extension. So for example, for a second order delta sigma modulator, this becomes tau of n is TVCO times Q of n minus Q of n minus one. Now Q of n is the quantizer error within the delta sigma modulator. The traditional model told us that with LSB third, this guy is white and is bounded to half, so which means that the average of the magnitude of this thing is about TVCO over square root of two. This is just an example. If you have a third order delta sigma, this expression will be different based on this expression for tau of n, but by following the same procedure, you can calculate how much is the extension, average extension of the charge pump on duration. And that way you can contribute the increased noise contribution of the charge pump. Okay. Increased noise is not the only challenge in delta sigma fraction and phase lock loops. Nonlinearity in the phase lock loop circuits can cause very strong spurious tones in the PLL's output. These are unwelcome in most applications, be they communications applications or wireline applications or data converter applications and so on. But where do these spurs come from? Right? We guaranteed that the quantization noise of the delta sigma has no spurs, right? It turns out that even if the delta sigma modulator's quantization noise, the shaped quantization noise, that's this gray part here, 
even if it does not have any spurs, any spurious stones, any nonlinearity acting on that can bring the spurs back, surprisingly. So let me illustrate using an image borrowed from Dr. Kevin Wang's work in 2008. Here, the quantization noise from a second order delta sigma modulator, the constant input of 0 0.002 and LS beta 3 is applied. So this quantization noise is taken and it is uh, passed through a square nonlinearity. And the power spectral densities are plotted both for the quantization noise itself and after the square nonlinearity. As you can see, the quantization noise itself has no spurious stones, but with the square nonlinearity, you have very strong spurious stones. Even though the delta sigma modulator's quantization noise, quantization has no spurs, the squaring unearths underlying periodicities. So what can cause nonlinearity in a fractional and phase lock loop? Several factors. Let us discuss three of the most important ones. First, mismatches in the charge pumps currents and dynamic nonlinearity are a big problem. The most popular way of addressing this problem is to operate the charge pump away from zero phase error. This is done by intentionally introducing a phase offset into the PLR. There is an attendant noise penalty with this approach, but it is fairly simple to implement. Second, code dependent delays in the frequency divider. The most popular way of addressing these is by resynchronizing the divider output using the VCO clock. Note that in many integer and PLLs, this is already employed to reduce uh, noise contribution of the divider. Right? I'm talking about actual circuit noise contribution of the divider. The third problem is caused by a poorly regulated phase detector supply. This causes dynamic delay variations in the phase detector, and that can cause strong spurs. Good supply regulation is a common fix for this problem. Note that this is by no means an exhaustive list of the sources of uh, nonlinearity in a fractional phase lock loop. There are several other sources. I'm just not going to discuss them here in the interest of time. Okay, to recap, we covered basic building blocks, frequency dividers with changing division ratio and digital delta sigma modulators. Then I described a closed loop approach called the delta sigma fraction and phase lock loop in quite some detail. And finally, let's look at open loop approaches. Consider a naive open loop approach. Suppose a high frequency PLL is followed by a frequency divider whose division ratio is changed according to a digital delta sigma modulator. We've already seen that this kind of division by n plus y of n causes a lot of phase noise in the divider output. In the case of a delta sigma fraction and phase lock loop, that output phase noise was suppressed by the PLL's low pass filter, equivalent low pass filter. However, in an open loop approach, there is no filter to suppress this phase noise. I'm showing that by this blank box here. In a normal fraction PLL, you would have a equivalent uh, low pass filter of the PLL, but in open loop approach, it's not there, right? So that means that whatever quantization noise is not suppressed. So if you look at this figure, the red and green curves are basically what you would get, phase noise you would get, if your delta sigma induced quantization noise is filtered by a 50 kilohertz loop and a 500 kilohertz loop. If there is no filtering, like in the open loop case, then that phase noise will keep increasing and only start reducing somewhere around FRF over two. So you can see that there is substantial phase noise here. And this is a fundamental challenge in open loop fractional frequency synthesis. So let's look at multiple approaches to deal with this. Thing. The first approach is to somehow filter the phase noise caused by dividing by n plus y of n. So if we had a high, qual high quality factor bandpass filter 
we could have simply filtered the phase noise. So here is our high frequency PLL. Here is our uh, divide, division by uh, n plus y of n. And we would have simply put a bandpass high, high, quality, high quality bandpass filter here that would have suppressed our noise. But unfortunately, we don't have high Q bandpass filters on chip. So a popular alternative is to use a second PLL, usually a low integer NPLL. So for example, let us say integer k and k is a small number, one or two. So the output frequency is k times PLL divided by m plus alpha. Now this is called a two loop solution because you have a main PLL and then a secondary PLL as well. And the fractional operation is done here. Now this works well. However, the problem is that the integer and PLL has its own oscillator, right? And it consumes a lot of power. Furthermore, there's a trade-off between the noise contributed by the fractional division, the frequency division, and the noise contributed by the oscillator in the second PLL. We want the second PLL to have very low bandwidth, for example, a 50 kilohertz bandwidth to get this green color. However, if you have a 50 kilohertz bandwidth, the noise from the oscillator in the second PLL is too big, too much, right? So basically, there's a trade-off between noise from the fractional division and noise from the oscillator. Essentially, the trade-offs are not that different from a simple uh, single fractional phase lock loop. A closely related variant is to use an injection locked oscillator rather than a full second PLL. The injection locked oscillator basically behaves like a PLL. Right? However, here too, we have noise and power consumption problems. A more interesting approach, at least in my opinion, is to use phase interpolators or time delay cells to basically achieve frequency synthesis. The basic idea is to divide the high frequency PLL output, VPLL, by n plus y of n, like before. However, y of n are not integers now, but small fractions multiples of one over M, where M is a reasonably large number. So for example, now we'll divide by N or N plus one eighth or N plus two eighths or N plus three eighths and so on. Now, if we could divide by fractional values rather than integers, we expect the phase noise to be much smaller because we are making smaller errors each time. So if you look at our model for the open loop fractional uh, synthesis, what happens is that this quantizer error Fractional division by n plus k over m means that this quantization error is m times smaller. So accordingly, you get a 20 log m dB improvement in the phase noise. The overall phase noise drops by 20 log m. Let's look at an example, okay? So without fractional frequency division and using a second order data sigma modulator, the phase noise would follow this blue dashed curve, right? If you want to have phase noise comparable to a 50 kilohertz delta sigma frac and PLL, then that means to get this green curve, we have to reduce the phase noise by roughly about 60 dB. That means we need an M of about 1000 to reduce this noise by about 60 dB. So in principle, if you can divide by one, if you can divide, if you can do frequency division in multiples of n plus one over, in multiples of one over 1000, this can be done. The problem is, how do you divide by a fraction? Here is an example, division by two plus two eighths. Assume that we have just m is equal to eight phases, just to keep things simple, okay? And let us assume that from a high frequency integer and PLL, for example, like an all digital PLL, let us say we have eight phases, phi zero, phi one, so on till phi seven. These are nominally equally spaced in, in phase. That means, for example, they'll be zero degree, 45 degree, 90, 135, and so on. Okay. A multiplexer, this MUX, selects one of these eight phases, and then we count N cycles of the chosen phase 
to generate an output edge, output rising edge. If the MUX always chooses the same phase, say phi zero, then the structure will simply divide by n. Instead, consider the case where the multiplexer changes its choice according to a sequence E of n generated by a phase select logic block. The phase select logic block is shown here. Basically, it's a digital accumulator. Um, it's digital accumulation of the fraction value alpha followed by a wraparound when the sum crosses unity. So effectively, this is a flying adder that we discussed earlier. The idea is easily explained with some animation. Suppose initially E of n is zero and the mux chooses phi zero. So the output edge coincides with phi zero. For the next cycle of the divider output, the alpha is equal to two over eight is accumulated and now E of n becomes two because the error here is two over eight and multiply by eight, E of n gets two. Because E of n is two, now the mux selects phase phi two. So that means now the selection jumped from phi zero to phi two. So now previously, now the output edge is aligned, aligned with phi two. So now if I see the distance between the first rising edge of the output and the second rising edge of the output, basically what you have, you have two full cycles and then the phase between or the distance between phi zero and phi two, which is about two eighths of a full cycle. So basically we have achieved counting by two and two eighth cycles of the PL. For the next cycle, the accumulator goes to four by eight. Accordingly, now E of n is four and now we choose phi four. Again, we have counted by, counted two plus two eight cycles of the PL. And the next time, now the accumulator goes to six by eight E of n is six now, and now we select phase six. Again, you have counted two plus two eight cycles of the PL. The next time around, the accumulator goes to zero, and now E of n is equal to zero. So now we again choose phi zero. So this way, by continuously cycling the selected phases, we can divide by two plus two eights. If alpha were not two eights, but let us say if it were one eighth, then you would have followed a different pattern phi zero, phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, so on till phi seven, and then back to phi zero. Bottom line, by setting alpha to a different multiple of one eighth, we can achieve frequency division by n plus that multiple over eight. To summarize, we divide a high frequency PLL output by fractional values n plus y of n like before, but now y of n is a multiple of one over n. YFN is still a digital delta sigma modulator, but now the difference is that it quantizes not to integers, but fractions that are multiples of one over n. Accordingly, the phase noise is 20 log m dB lower. Of course, the GDSM allows us to get arbitrarily fine frequency resolution, and by changing, adding an m of n to alpha, we can also get angle modulation. But how do we choose y of n? The choice is not the same as in a delta sigma fractional phase lock loop, because unlike in the fractional phase lock loop, there is no subsequent filter to suppress the fractional div division noise. So usually we restrict ourselves to first order or second order delta sigma modulators. If you use any higher order, the phase noise rises too quickly and that is unacceptable for many applications. But First order delta sigma modulators have spurious tone problems. Like we mentioned earlier, LSB dither doesn't work. So we have to be careful with the choice that we make. here. For applications that care about phase noise and jitter, it is desirable to make M very large. If you recall, M is equal to 1000 was needed to get the phase noise equivalent to a, a 48 refer megahertz reference rack and PLL. Right, with a 50 kilohertz bandwidth. So how can such high resolution be achieved? The key idea is to align the divider output when needed with a signal 
whose phase can be specified with the resolution of 2 pi over m. Such a block is called a digital to phase converter or a digital to time delay converter, DTC. Several techniques are known to realize this. Thing. The delay chain approach, which I'm showing you over here, basically takes a MUX output, let us say Vx, and then delays it by a programmable amount. So you have a digital control of these capacitors that will achieve a programmable amount of delay on Vx. An alternative approach is to employ phase interpolation. This is also called phase mixing sometimes. Here, the MUX chooses adjacent phases, for example, Vx and Vy, example, 90 and 135. The chosen phases are fed to a weighted summer. Here is a, a differential amplifier-based weighted summer, and here is an inverter-based weighted summer. Basically, what we do is we change the weights in the summer. So in the case of the inverter-based summer, both these inverters drive the same node V out. So if the control code Y is zero, then phi out um, is certain delay, a delayed version of uh, phi Y. Whereas if the code Y is zero, is one, then the output is nominally the same delayed version of phi X. And if the code Y is between zero and one, then the output is a nominal delay, delayed version of an intermediate phase. Similarly here, if Y is zero, then the output will follow phi Y. If y is 1, output will follow phi x. And for intermediate value, the output will follow an intermediate phase between 90 and 135. In effect, we get fine programmable phase control in addition to the coarse control from the MUX. So typically, let us say you have eight phases here. That's a three-bit control. And let us say you have I don't know, seven bit control on this code Y. So overall, you basically have a 10 bit phase control. That means you're able to specify the phase to within uh, two pi over 1024, that accurately. That is M is 1024 in that case. Now, these blocks are variously referred to as digital to phase converters, digital to time converters, phase interpolators, phase mixers, and so on. The choice of the technique usually depends on the technology. Implementations in very fine CMOS nodes prefer the inverter-based approaches. Older technology nodes prefer the differential amplifier-based approaches. Whichever approach is adopted, several challenges present themselves. First, mismatches are inevitable. They can be systematic or they can be random. Secondly, the mismatches can be PVT-dependent and can vary a great deal with temperature. And finally, circuit nonlinearity is also possible. Example, if you use a differential amplifier-based implementation, you could get a GM nonlinearity. In spite of these challenges, state-of-the-art has reported 8 to 10 bit resolution on about 2 to 5 gigahertz carrier frequencies. This corresponds to an incredible sub-100 femtosecond uh, resolution. Let's take a closer look at the mismatch problem. What is the effect of these mismatches? Let's consider a simple case of a low resolution that is M is equal to eight, three bit system. For any given fraction alpha, the phases are chosen in a particular periodic manner. So for example, when we want to get a fraction of two over eight, we chose the phases as phi zero, phi two, phi four, phi six. Right? Start with phi zero, phi two, phi four, phi six, and so on. If there are any phase errors, the output clock's phase will see the phase errors in a similar periodic manner. So for example, when we pick phase, phase phi zero, we get an error delta zero. When we pick phase phi two, we get an error delta two. When we pick phase phi four, we get phase error delta four. And when we pick phase phi six, we get error delta six. And then we again go back to delta zero. So basically, it means that the phase error is strongly periodic. And accordingly, you see a very strong spur in the power spectral density of the output clock. Now, how bad is the spur problem? Seemingly small phase errors can also cause strong spurious tones because the errors are all accumulating into a single tone. 
Here I show measurements from a recent phase interpolator based open loop frequency synthesis system from our group. With a raw resolution of about 12 bits, approximately 90 femtosecond RMS integrated jitter integrated over the 10 kilohertz to 40 megahertz band was demonstrated. Measured fractional spurs that I'm showing you here and here, they are about 60 dB below the carrier for about 2.4 gigahertz carrier. This is comparable to state-of-the-art commercial clock generators, which report about 80 dB for sub-gigahertz carriers. While the jitter is acceptable for many applications, the spurs that are about 60 dB below the carrier um, are too strong for many communications applications. And note, like I said, this is state-of-the-art. Even commercial uh, clock generators are at the same level. So how do we deal with these mismatches? The primary approach is to use digital calibration. The flavor of calibration depends on the particular application. I will describe one approach from our group just to illustrate the basic uh, principle. In this approach, during a calibration period, the phase interpolator is included inside a digital PLL. So this is your phase interpolator. This is basically, um, you take a high frequency PLL, you have a divider that generates multiple phases and the MUX and the interpolator are combined in this block. So this is your basically your friction divisions, the phase interpolator. And then in a calibration period, it is wrapped around in this overall digital PLL system. During study state, the phase interpolator code is suddenly changed by a substantial amount. For example, let us say from zero to 324. In response, the output of the time to digital converter, the TDC inside the digital PLL will jump and then slowly decay as the PLL corrects for it. By measuring the amount of the jump, we can estimate what is the actual delay caused by the chosen code. Of course, native TDC resolution will not suffice. Just to give you an idea, if we have a 10 bit interpolator or 2.4 gigahertz that we are talking about sub 100 femtosecond phase steps. And if you're trying to cancel for errors in there, which has in the order of tens of femtoseconds, that is significantly finer than 3DC resolution. But what happens is that we can repeat this measurement again and again several times. And then we can average over all of those measurements to um, steadily improve the accuracy of this measurement. So this way, we just repeat it again and again, improve the accuracy. By doing this thing for a jump from zero to 324, we basically measured the actual phase error, phase caused by the code 324. We repeat this thing for different codes like 227, 530 and whatnot, and then you construct a pre-distortion table. That pre-distortion table can be used to linearize the errors in this phase interval. So these are measured linearity uh, measure, uh, results from that phase interpolator before and after the correction. The figure on the left is before the correction. As you can see, the as the code varies, uh, the phase changes quite a bit. You can see substantial error uh, stretching up to several LS, uh, tens of LSPs. Once you use the pre-distortion, then you can linearize uh, to the 10-bit, 11-bit level uh, fairly easily. Now, another approach directly cancels the spurs resulting from the mismatches rather than linearizing the entire code to phase transfer function. Here, the main DPC block and the following divider, they represent an open loop frequency synthesizer. So these are the phases from a high frequency integer and PLL, and these are the open loop frequency synthesizer. Now, this guy has a fairly low noise 90 femtoseconds or so, but it has strong spurs, 60 dB spurs. The idea is to basically extract spur information and then use a cancellation path. So here is our low noise main clock that has spurs. We use an auxiliary DPC and a divide by N. That means another open loop frequency synthesizer to generate another clock at the same frequency. But this clock 
he's very noisy but has no spurs. I'm not going to describe how we do this thing because that's fairly involved. But the idea is there is a way of um, there's a way of generating a very very low spur clock, but by paying a huge penalty in terms of noise. But let us say, for argument's sake, we have such a clock. And now we compare this low noise main clock and the noisy but spur free auxiliary clock. And how do we compare their phases? We use a bang bang phase detector. The bang bang phase detector will basically produce a one bit digital output that contains both the spurs of the main clock and the noise from the second clock. Then we use a comb filter based. Um, comb, basically, we use comb filters to extract the spur information and suppress all the noise information. And then we use LMS algorithms to adjust the gain and feed a cancellation signal back to our main open loop frequency, open loop frequency synthesizer. So basically, there are spurs here. We extract the spurs and then put in an appropriate negative sign and then subtract it from the phase of the main uh, open loop synthesizer. Measurement results show that spurs caused by mismatches can be reduced to about 100 dB below the carrier. You can see these without cancellation, what I showed you earlier, and these with cancellation, the spurs are less than 100 dB. Note that this is just one particular example. Such adaptive spur cancellation techniques can be quite promising, particularly in fine CMOS technologies where digital logic is cheap. The key idea is to somehow digitally extract the spur information. Once you do that thing, then you can always feed in a cancellation signal into the open loop frequency synthesizer to cancel it. To improve the cancellation, we can always use an adaptive system to optimize the gains and phases and so on. So in conclusion, we took a generalized view of various frequency synthesis approaches. We identified two key building blocks, frequency division with changing division ratios and digital delta signal modulators. And then we discussed both closed loop and open loop frequency synthesis approaches that essentially use the same two building blocks in different ways. I have a bunch of references here uh, for those of you who are interested. Um, some of them are on the dither, some of them are on the various open loop um, digital to phase converter uh, techniques and so on and so forth. Uh, Thank you for listening attentively to this tutorial. Thank you, Sudhakar. That was a fantastic talk. And now it's time for Q&A. Uh, so if there's any question from the audience, please use the chat window to ask your question. Um, <clears throat> In the meantime, uh, let me start with uh, a simple question. So, um, um, Sudhaka, you mentioned that even the commercial clock generators have minus 60 dBc kind of spurs, which are not sufficient for commercial applications. So then how do commercial products uh, meet the spur requirements? Yeah, so... I was referring to commercial multiple clock generators. So companies like Silicon Labs, iTime, and so on, they sell multi-clock generators. So I'm referring to those things. So if you want to deal with um, um, dedicated products where you want an extremely clean system, that's what I was referring to as the single PLL systems. And there, um, closed loop systems like a FRACN or an all digital PLL, the state of the art is way better over there. Now, if you have to use one of these commercial ones, then filtering helps somewhat. Subsequent filtering by using another PLL or so, provided the spurs are outside the bandwidth of that PL. Thank you. Um, there was a question earlier. Uh, that was seeking recommendation 
on partitioning the LDOs in a fraction synthesizer. Uh, could you elaborate on that answer? Sure. Yeah, so usually it depends on how tight a requirement you're trying to meet. Um, assuming you have very tight requirements, generally you want to keep the VCO on a separate regulator and the phase detector and charge pump probably on a separate regulator and the divider possibly on a separate regulator. Um, more importantly, if you have if you are very sensitive to spurs and so on, fractional spurs, uh, whether you have two or three regulators, uh, what is more important is to very carefully simulate coupling between them so that you have an idea for what level of fractional spurs you can expect and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me there's, there's one more question online. Um, how do you compare the spur performance of these type of analog charge pump PLL with AD PLL? Yeah, any day a well-designed uh, digital PLL will have a better spur performance, but the key factor being well-designed. So um, Bogdan may not agree with me on some parts, but let's look at the ADPLL. Pretty much all of the blocks in there have become digital except for the TDC. Fundamentally, the TDC still remains an analog block even though it uses inverters and so on. So there will be nonlinearity there and it will cause uh, fractional spurs. Having said that, dealing with only one block is way better than dealing with five different analog blocks with all kinds of spurs. On top of that, in an ADPLL, most of the signals are available to you as digital ones, which means that you can put in fairly sophisticated calibration loops and so on to suppress any of these spurs. Like Mike Chen's group at USE, they have shown that with a fairly sophisticated digital calibration, they can even suppress the spurs coming from the TDC that I'm worried about. So overall, I think a well-designed ADPLL with a bunch of calibration techniques, clever techniques thrown in, will outperform the spur performance of an analog PLL any day. Thank you. Um, let me just quickly check if there's any other um, question. And if not, um, e your answer is a perfect segue to our next talk, which is from Mike Chen on <laughs> low spur PLL architectures. Uh, but we have to wait a little bit because it's lunchtime, at least in Boston. And so, so we will uh, take a break and